Right, good morning, everyone. Uh, just give me a wave if you can hear me. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, welcome everyone to this first session of um, the third day of the um, uh, Marine Energy Wales Annual Conference. My name is Simon Cheeseman. I work for the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult, and I'm going to be the chair um, of today's session. Um, so today, this session is going to talk about um, a blueprint for cost reduction. And I just want to provide a couple of introductory slides just to do a bit of a scene set and then we'll introduce the panel. So, as I said, my name is Simon Cheeseman from the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. Um, my background is marine energy. I've been in renewables for um, just over 10 years now. Uh, previously, I worked for the Energy Technologies um, Partnership in Loughborough, uh, where we were installing um, both wave and tidal devices in, um, in Orkney at the European Marine Energy Centre, and also looking at some of the first um, tool sets as well for the sector. Um, I now work for um, the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. We're a profit organisation. We're the UK's uh, leading um, independent research organisation looking at renewables across um, offshore wind, wave and tidal energy. Um, we've got offices um, up and down the country. I actually run the office down in the southwest, down in Cornwall. Um, and we're very proud. We've got our office in Wales, in Pembroke. And you would have heard the um, uh, Paul Ellsmore from our organisation speaking about the activities that occur in, um, in that office um, yesterday. Um, the Catapult is really involved in um, all aspects of renewable energy, um, offshore renewable energy. Um, we typically start to get involved about technology readiness level um, four. Um, we've got a suite of national task des test assets at um, Blythe, just outside of Newcastle, where we do um, a variety of tests on really anything before it, it goes offshore, whether that's um, wind turbine blades, uh, drive trains, um, tidal drive trains, subsea cables, we've got a high voltage um, laboratory. We're getting more and more involved in um, autonomous systems. And because we're, we're sort of looking over the horizon at um, what the new technology is gonna be, we, we get involved in and perhaps what I like to call some of the, what, what today seem the more weirder designs, but obviously are sort of reality um, for tomorrow. Um, but we've got a, a, a really good um, panel lined up today. Um, and so the panel are going to ponder the question around um, all marine um, energy technologies need to reduce um, their levels of energy in order to compete with more established renewables and progress to commercialization. So this session is actually going to explore how these technologies can be met, uh, how the technologies can meet this challenge through innovation, uh, lessons learned and deployment. And by that, I mean sort of learning by doing and deliver to the market. So um, we've got a panel of um, what I'd like, what I regard as highly experienced and highly paid experts. And I think it's your duty as delegates to um, not only give them your undivided attention, but also use this time wisely to ask them some challenging questions, because that's why we're all here and that's what they want to do. Right. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce um, our first um, panellist and ask them to introduce themselves and their organisation. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to kickstart this um, panel session um, with Guy Raymond, who's the Floating Wind Knowledge Manager at RWE. Guy, the uh, the stage is yours. Without spooking us out with that um, <laughs> freaky... Uh... Yeah, thank you, Simon. <clears throat> Hopefully you can hear me. Um, I can hear you loud and clear, yeah. And you should now be able to see my presentation. Just coming up. Yep, that's all good. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you for the introduction, Simon. Um, yep, Guy Raymond from RWE. And today my presentation is, is solely focused on, on offshore floating wind. Uh, so RWE is a global renewables developer and operator. We're very much established in Wales and we have big ambitions in floating wind. So <clears throat> we have a diversified portfolio across onshore and offshore wind utility solar and energy storage. And we're currently operating just under five gigawatts of fixed offshore wind in Europe. 
in Wales. Uh, RWE, uh, managed by our sister company, RWE Generation, owns Pembroke Gas Turbine Power Station. So alongside the other renewable assets, uh, there's a total of 11 sites operating in Wales with a total capacity of just over 2.6 megawatts. From a floating perspective, RWE aims to deploy over one gigawatt or up to one gigawatt of floating wind by 2030. And by that point, we want to have secured at least five gigawatts of pipeline. So very happy to talk about innovation today. Innovation and industry build out, you know, central to, to our development strategy. And we believe that it is innovation that will, of course, drive the long term cost reduction that we need to deploy at scale. So floating must be com cost comparable to fix by 2030. But of course, that doesn't happen, happen on its own. For us, it's an evolution, not a revolution. You know, we have an existing supply chain. We have an existing, you know, big competence and, and stock of expertise within offshore fixed. And that's what we will draw upon for floating. So how does innovation work with us or how does it work in, and sit in our, our development strategy? Well, innovation roadmaps are the, you know, the key driver at this stage to help us address those knowledge gaps, help break down barriers to, to deployment and for, to help us foresee future challenges. And we believe that we, we really are driving uh, floating innovation globally with our, with our three active demonstration projects. So there's some, some impressions down there on the right, some graphics. We have Demis, Demisath in northern Spain, a two megawatt platform. The Neve project in Maine, the USA, another single, single unit platform at 10 megawatts. And Tetraspa in Norway at 3.6. So part of our kind of stepping stone strategy is moving from demonstration, where this is all about learning by doing, you know, understanding cost, driving down uh, risk and, and, and testing engineering knowledge and minimizing complex engineering so we can commercialize and industrialize faster. Then moving into pilot projects. So we're now actively seeking at least two new pilot projects between the one and 400 megawatt scale globally to and then this, this is the point where we, we think we'll start to see those, those significant cost reductions. We can test <clears throat> and validate all of our assumptions around economies of scale. But I think the key message for us is that to, to drive cost reduction, we have to be able to deploy at scale. And that's going to be coming from, from innovation. So moving on to industry build out, <clears throat> for us, it's all about building confidence. So for us as developers, you know, we need a coherent program of leasing, offtake and revenues. We need the confidence that there's, that there's going to be the market support there. And the industry and the supply chain need that the visibility of that pipeline, you know, to enable the, the rapid growth that we need. From a technology perspective, you know, for all, all emerging renewable energy platforms and technologies, they have to work. We have to prove that confidence, develop that, that confidence within the market, within the investors. And supply chain need time to both prepare from a scaling up perspective and also to, to, to start to catalyze some competition again to drive down cost. I think perception of risk, you know, applies to all of us in, in this space, um, both internally and externally. And a key focus for me within my role at RWE is, is preparing the business and helping us to transition from the, the established and dominant fixed offshore model into the floating model where there, of course, are differences. Then finally, <clears throat> from an industry perspective, we get an awful lot of value from the joint industry groups, whether it's the, the offshore renewable energy catapult, uh, the, the, the carbon trust, these joint industry groups can, you know, really are resolving and, and addressing lots of the, the industry wide issues and, and the barriers to, to mass deployment. So then finally, I think it, it, it wouldn't be, uh, we wouldn't be doing this, this conference justice without talking about the Celtic Sea. And we do feel that, you know, this is a strategic focus for us and it can deliver multi gigawatts. The map here is just highlighting in red our, our main focus targets over the next 18 months. So we have the US, the UK, France and, and Japan. But what we're seeing is that there's rapidly uh, f you know, other fast developing markets trailing behind. So. You know, the east coast of the US, we've got Spain, Portugal, Ireland, Norway, Sweden, Poland, Taiwan, Korea. It's far, they, all these all these these markets are developing, and there's no reason why the Celtic Sea can't be can't be on that map. You know, it's uncongested. There's a good wind resource, and there's a lot of local expertise, especially from further towards the north from the offshore wind um, region that could be drawn upon. My colleague today, Alex Meredith from RWE, will be talking about Drager Moore, which is a proposed 100 megawatt stepping stone um, pre-commercial project. 
that we're proposing that what we do feel will help to to springboard offshore wind in Wales. So I won't talk about that that too much today. Um, but we feel, yeah, like I said, you know, the Celtic Sea must be on the map. Uh, priorities need to be leasing, supporting the Crown Estate, looking at, at grid infrastructure needs upgrades, um, and really tapping into the existing supply chain, the value chain, and, and the collaborations that, that must exist there. Thank you, Simon. Okay, thanks very much, Guy. That was a, um, a, a good comprehensive um, review of uh, RWE activity. Um, you pick up later on the points you make about uh, innovation driving um, cost reduction and then also driving out risk. Um, and I, and I think we, we, we need to convince you that actually down here in the southwest and Wales, there's actually a very good supply chain. You don't necessarily have to look northeast for um, experience in offshore wind. But uh, no, excellent yeah, um, Absolutely agree. If we can move on, um, I'd invite uh, James Davis, Chair of Industry Wales, to uh, introduce himself and talk to us a little bit about uh, Industry Wales. James, the stage is yours. Thanks, Simon. Uh, it's good to be here. I'm going to come from this on cost reduction, as in developing a supply chain. I'm going to pick up on two words so far. Um, the catapult has told us already that, you know, we need to transform supply chains and engage with them to ensure we are, we are cost efficient. We'll cut, touch that on the last point. Two points that worry me so far are the word weird design uh, and the one that brought me some comfort was evolution. <laughs> so we need to context that into in the, in the case of supply chain development uh, for cost reduction. Well, let me just uh, uh, pinpoint one thing. One of the biggest lessons learned on supply chain development this year was the reshoring of critical equipment, uh, medical devices, PPE, etc. Uh, to the UK and to Wales on COVID-19. Now, when I was asked to present to the procurement conference in October, I led with the line, if you expose demand and need with visible route to order to a wider supply chain, they bring expertise to deliver quality costs and delivery. Um, but if you don't do that engagement and exposure at the right time and in the right way, then actually it's quite a struggle to transform supply chains uh, to see the benefit of coming into new sectors or transferring into different sectors. In contacts that with two things. One is uh, who we are. We're an industry voice. Uh, there are 34 clusters and forums uh, in sort of manufacturing, engineering and technology. Uh, we try to bring them together as a significant voice into Welsh Government uh, for intervention. Um, we're experienced industrialists, that's all we are. Uh, what do I know about supply chain development? I know I, know, I don't know enough yet. Uh, always learning. And I, but I have been involved in some significant global innovative products into conservative sectors uh, based on risk and low margin. Uh, particularly my background is Kaizen continuous improvement, or in other words, evolution, uh, rather than revolution, if you want to bring the market at right cost and the significance of that. And then just a little bit of background, this would be, um, I'm sure, and we're looking at the, at the colors and the sizes of triangles, et cetera. But I'm supply chain development for economic good within, within Wales. Uh, and therefore, more often than not, I'm agnostic of, of, of as was above the borderline here. Uh, my activity is really about what's below the waterline and ensuring that, you know, whether it's direct, indirect services, MROs, etc., we're developing and transforming supply chains. That brings economic wealth, but also anchorage within our nation or nations uh, and actually ensures that we'll be sustainable for the future. So that, that is where I'm coming from this morning. Sometimes, therefore, I, I'm, I, I'm asking questions like, why, why does the physics say we should use that material? when we have no capacity whatsoever to be able to draw that in? How do we bring new capacity in, but also more importantly, transform uh, or trans transition a lot of the sectors that we currently have on it? When I looked at some of the work by the capital, I categorized some of the fundamentals on cost reduction as quite simply this. Engage and inspire, don't reinvent the wheel, build consensus on commodities and partner wisely. The bit that I'm not allowed to show you is uh, is that I go into a bit more depth on that from some of the experiences we've got uh, here uh, over, over the time. In so much what we mean by inspiring supply chain is uh, ensure we've got skills and capacity at the right time and ensure we've got roadmaps to transition them rather than creating revolutions while we're displacing significant amounts of current supply chain activity itself. Not overselling, working with current partners. Uh, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. Wonderful stories about how the, the German car industry ensures that actually under the bonnet, 
there are standards and materials that go across every single one of those competitors and they don't they don't fight on those issues they fight on what is the usp on it but they ensure that they're using the standards at material level and also a technology solution level wonderful stories about airbus ceo of airbus coming into a design office one day to discover they, they had a team of 12 people designing a new hinge and he asked the basic question he said how many hinges do we have in airbus today and a few weeks later did the answer we have 136 and they stopped the project the next day building consensus of commodities are where you need to come together to agree rather than developing solutions or that perhaps diversify the supply chain and don't bring the capacity of the aggregation of demand on it and then protect and partnering wisely to ensure that you don't over protect your ip to ensure that you can get the connections or the materials or whatever across the board on it i come to the last slide on this today uh the, these are the mundane on um, the 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 report and the catapult points these i think these are the mundane the supply chain capability is there today it's existing it needs transitioning needs transforming but please don't step outside these issues otherwise the cost will increase significantly for us as we displace and have to bring in new massive investment to achieve it and that and then the vitals the vitals more often are not within the capacity and capability of the raw materials and ensuring the supply chain would build up from that point in place I'll leave it there. I'm sure that there'll be enough people to attack me later on on some of these subjects. But what I would just say, don't reinvent the wheel. Find your USP, develop and focus on that and ensure you're using the other standards in the current supply chains where you want to transition them into your particular solutions. Thank you. Simon, I'm sorry, but you've hit the first, uh, you're on mute, sir. Even realize it didn't but thank you for paying attention <laughs> james thanks very much indeed for uh, for your introduction there you, you raised some interesting points around supply chain and maybe we'll come back to you know that question what is a supply chain cluster and, and how does that you know need to operate um so thank you very much for that um next up is tim baker tim welcome uh tim's marine energy director at black and beach tim uh, would you like to uh, introduce yourself and black and beach Simon, thanks for the introduction. Um, so, yeah, it seems to have gone through. That's great. So, um, so, so I, I lead the the marine energy team at, at Black and Beach, and we we cover floating wind and and tidal stream and and wave predominantly. Um, I'm I'm just going to share um, some of my experience and 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 hopefully insights of of uh, of sort of trying to optimize um, the the else. And that's both through scale and through technical innovation. And you know that that experience comes from around twenty years of being in the innovation space, um, originally in aeros in aerospace, but now more recently through through marine energy. Um, so I've got really three main points to get across. So the first point I'm I'm going to call it the the story of the two twins. Um, so that there's two twin engineers, engineers, and and they're keen to reduce the LCOE of their of their product. And they're going to go about it in, in a couple of different ways. So, Bob's got um, this particularly detailed design of a uh, model of his of his blade. It's, it's a really good model, very detailed. It's highly accurate. He's really really pleased about it. Um, he understands that there's lots of other bits other than the blade that need optimizing, but but he realizes he can't possibly you know d develop such a detailed model for all of the other bits like electrical system that are going to be as good as his blade model. So, he thinks well. That's fine. I understand if I make my blade more efficient, then LCE will go down. And indeed, that is true. So he designs a new blade and you see the bottom left LCE is improved. Alice takes a, a different approach. Um, she really, we've got blade design, but we've got loads of other bits as well. We've got foundations and structure and electrical. And she accepts that although her model can't be nearly as detailed as Bob's, she realizes it's important to have some kind of overall system model. She designs a blade. And actually, the blade she designs when she goes through the full optimization, it's actually slightly worse on its own in terms of LCE. But what that does is that blade enables her to reduce loads, put a much larger rotor on, and she gets a much, much bigger reduction in LCE than Bob. So simplified example, but the takeaway there is you need to work out what you're trying to optimize. 
and you need to have a whole system model which is as big as the thing you're trying to optimize so if that's lcoe you need a full system lce model if actually what you're trying to optimize is financial return to your investors you need to have a financial model so make sure you've got a whole system model that's point one um second point of three then so i mean what what does a kind of state-of-the-art really focused r d project look like in 2021 so we've got some some good examples here and you're always going to need to start with some innovation um some idea generation but where does that come from well you can look back at previous products um you can look at lessons learned history and you can do lots of standard you know, idea innovating ideas in terms of brainstorming and other techniques so you've got this bucket of ideas what are you going to do with them there's some good ideas in there that how do we work out which ones to focus our effort on so this comes back to point one you need a whole system model and the, the power of that is it allows us to do some filtering and some prioritization so i've got limited budget limited resources where do i focus them so i use that as a filter out of that we take the one that are the high priority combinations of different and then device so we we put our resources into it we go through concept design through some testing through some detailed design and outspits technology so my last point point three um well what about some results so that's really the process that we want to follow well we're, we're fortunate to have a really good example um black and Vich have been working with orbital marine recently on on one of their tiger projects um and we can we can announce some some really exciting results from that project today um so we started um with a baseline of around 240 pounds a megawatt hour um and we've now got evidence from that project that we can get down to around 60 pounds a megawatt hour in tidal stream um so that's really exciting obviously um let, let, let's just think about how we're doing that so that big lcoe reduction is split into two main categories um the first one's scale i.e what happens if you take basically the same technology the same turbine but you make more of them and that represents about 50 percent of the lce reduction um so that's things like really really enabling volume manufacture um making sure you've designed it to enable scale and volume manufacture but also things like array electrical layout and that's about half of your cost reduction the other 50 percent comes from things like technology so this is for a single turbine how do i improve that um it <clears throat> should be no surprise that larger rotors are a key part to that we've seen those trends in wind um so we're looking at going from 20 up to 28 meters how do you do that well you need to reduce loads to do that and we're looking at some really innovative pitch control to do that um we've also looked at some novel anchoring systems um and we've developed what what we're terming a digital twin for O&M planning which uses both 20 years of hindcast meditation data and also some forecast meditation data so what are the key takeaways just to wrap up well number one you need definitely definitely need a full system model um number two don't forget about scale it's not all about technology um and thirdly finally i guess we've got a really positive outlook here from marine renewables that we've got you know, evidence that we can be cost competitive um so that's all for me um thanks and back to simon there simon you know all through tim's presentation i was keep thinking must unmute yourself must unmute yourself tim thank you very much indeed for your presentation a great soundbite there around 60 pounds per megawatt i'm sure we'll come back to that um and now i'd like to move on to um, oliver rag oliver is a commercial director at uh, orbital marine um oliver uh, stage is yours thanks very much simon uh and yeah so for those of you who don't mind, my name is oliver rag i'm the commercial director at orbital marine power uh, i've been working in the sector for about 12 years or so now um i'm very happy to provide you with uh, a bit more of an update as to as to what we're up to within orbital marine power uh at, at, at the moment and i suppose kind of following on with a bit more detail from what uh, tim had presented in terms of this uh i suppose um you know uh, ambitious and um, you know, fairly aggressive uh, approach that we've got to, to reducing uh, LCOE. Um, I mean, just quick way in terms of, of background here, you know, this is, uh, I suppose, a brief 
you know, recent history of what we've been up to within Orbital. Uh, so in 2008, we, we deployed the SR2000 at EMIC. Uh, over a 12 month test period that produced over 3.2 gigawatt hours into the UK grid. Um, probably one of the most successful prototype turbines uh, ev ever deployed. Um, it, you know, many of you may have seen the power performance uh, graphs that we've produced. Um, and that really helps to highlight the importance of this floating structure in terms of operations and maintenance uh, and how easy it is for us to get on, fix things on the turbine. We followed that up uh, of the O2 turbine. Um, we secured seven million pounds of grant funding and support from the Scottish government and also from the European Commission. Uh, the O2 is currently in build at the moment. Uh, and normally it wouldn't be an orbital presentation without me giving you lots of um, you know, uh, flashy pictures of the of the build of the machine. But um, Andrew Scott's presenting later, so I'm not going to steal under any of his uh, thunder uh, and, and leave him to updates on, on the build of the machine. Um, needless to say, it, it's well on track for uh, installation uh, summer this year up in, up in Orkney. Um, I'm also pleased to inform everybody, you may have seen, we recently closed a crowdfunding round on Crowdcube, uh, raised an additional 2.6 million pounds of equity investment from 3,000 new, um, which is really great for us as a company now because it enables us to push forward with um, some of these cost reduction initiatives, like what we've been working on with Black & Beach through the Tiger project. Uh, and it also enables us to grow our pipeline of, of future opportunities. Um, you know, in the short to immediate term, uh, we're focused on putting the second O2 machine you know, with enhanced innovation to drive down LCOE uh, at the European Marine Energy Centre alongside the O2. So that would create the first tidal array, uh, hopefully at EMEC in, within the next couple of years. And looking further ahead, you know, we're very hopeful that we'll um, see some um, you know, dedicated uh, support through the CFD mechanism for tidal energy under auction round four. And under that, we're reviewing and looking opportunities, kind of building our success of our UK supply chain story uh, and to hopefully build out some of those first arrays um, within the UK. But in terms of, of cost reduction, as highlighted, you know, there's kind of uh, seven high priority areas that we're looking at across the turbine as a whole. Um, so we saw the waterfall chart that Tim had provided in terms of cost reduction, but broken down uh, simply, what does this look like? It, it's optimized o &M. So we believe that we already have a really excellent uh, platform and structure for o &M. Um, But we think that this can be improved ever so slightly. So we'll be looking at that. It's also looking at things like predictive o &M and the data that we'll be collecting from the O2 uh, so that we can look at the you kind of condition monitoring of the whole system, look at where we're likely to see um, failures so that we can actually enact preventative maintenance. Uh, in terms of the blades, again, a key area for increasing the yield. And as Tim said, we're looking at larger rotor diameters, but also how we can improve the, the design to actually extract the energy more efficiently. Um, one of the other things that's important for us to highlight is the advanced pitch control system. And um, this is an area that we, we spent a lot of time looking at on the, on the design of the O2 and working with our supply chain partners, SKF and the drivetrain as a whole. Uh, and to some extent, um, you know, when we we're talking about this internally uh, the other day, we we're saying, well, actually what we've done uh, on this turbine is um, with, with the pitch control system that we've put in here, because the blades can be individually controlled. Uh, so we've got individual pitch control. Um, we've almost installed the, the equivalent of like a Ferrari engine uh, on this machine, but um, I think we'll be uh, you know, <laughs> loath to take it out of second gear for quite a few years. Uh, yeah, so that we can build up that the operational data. But obviously, that's excellent to kind of have that in our back pocket um, to be able to drive down that and actually hopefully improve the efficiency of the machine. It's kind of the equivalent of, I suppose, kind of updating some firmware or, or something like that or, on a piece of hardware that you already efficiencies and optimization from that. As I said, there's also optimization in the powertrain, uh, looking at integrating um, several machines together in a subsea junction box. Um, importantly, this isn't a subsea hub. So there's no uh, transformer equipment or power electronics subsea in this. It's literally just a, a connection point. Um, and again, we think that's important for reducing the operating costs because uh, we keep all of the power electronics predominantly within the turbine or onshore. 
Um, so there's no need to, to engage in this. And then finally, we're also looking at rock bolts uh, as a key opportunity to reduce cost because we've been using gravity anchors in the past. And obviously, there's a lot of additional mass uh, within that. And if we can remove the mass, you know, that, that's removing cost. So what does this all kind of look like overall? Uh, and as Tim said, um, you know, really exciting that we we, we put together a, a, a credible route to get down to 60 pounds a megawatt hour. Um, importantly, I will highlight that, you know, this is at what we're terming kind of fast flow sites. So this is at sites of 3.3 meters a second plus that, that sort of, of um, speed is what we're looking at. Uh, and in this graph, you can see on the right hand side, what I've put together is how LCOE varies with flow speed. Um, I mean, th this is this is obviously the same with all renewable resources. You know, uh, wind projects in the south of England have lower capacity factors than they do in the north of Scotland, uh, and as a result, that impacts on on the LCOE as well. You know, as does the um, capacity factor difference between onshore wind and, and offshore wind. Um, what I've done also on this graph is lay behind it a kind of a recent history of um, costs for um, you know, power production for LCOE within the UK from varying other technologies. So down in the left hand corner, you can see that the wholesale price, um, which is actually just slowly on the on the increase, you see it's 60 pounds a megawatt hour, we're just getting within touching distance on that. So, you know, depending how things go, if that continues to increase, then we'll actually see uh, that intersect at some point. Um, interestingly, again, solar, uh, we're looking at the moment, you know, if, if we'd have done all this innovation, we're putting, uh, we'd done the 200 megawatts of deployment, we'd be looking at coming in, hopefully, you know, in some fast flow sites competitive with solar. Um, but importantly, and I think this is where, you know, we look at um, engagement with government and understanding, you know, uh, as the Minister Kwasi Kwarteng says, we can't do this at any cost. Um, uh, the majority of this deployment, you know, so the 10 gigawatts that we have in the UK, so 9.8 gigawatts of that, if we're to deploy 200 megawatts, we're coming in cheaper than nuclear, um, which we think is really important point to, to highlight here. You know, we're not saying do this at any cost. Um, yes, the first 200 megawatts uh, within our technology, and obviously we need competition across the industry, so it's more than just 200 megawatts. We need supported with additional revenue support to help us drive that down to get economies of scale. But if we do that, the majority of this indigenous resource uh, that we have across the UK and you know, very large amount of it is based in Wales, uh, can be delivered at, at you know, cost that's competitive with other forms of generation at the moment. Uh, and, and the important thing when we look at that, you know, as well, not just in terms of the technology, but in terms of the cost of capital, you know, uh, the graph on the left hand side, um, as I'm looking at it, yeah, you should be left hand side as well, I get confused by these things, um, is that that's, that's the cost of wind energy over time. So wind energy has got to the cost it has now uh, from almost 40 years of technology development. Now, obviously, we're able to take some technology transfer in terms of pitch control system, rotating machinery, etc. Um, but we're at a much earlier stage, obviously. And the graph on the right hand side was um, from a recent report uh, produced by the Offshore Renewable Energy Capital. Really interesting looking at this uh, in terms of cost of capital. Uh, and what I've done with the, the cheeky uh, orange that I've used for, the, uh, <laughs> for our logo there is chart where we're trying to get to for the, the cost of debt on our projects. So the cost of debt for our, for our first crowdfunding debenture through abundance was between 14 to 12 percent, something like that, for a construction bond. Bearing in mind that that's the first ever uh, construction bond for tidal energy that's ever been launched. We, yeah, that, that's not a bad starting point, actually. Um, we hope for the, some of the first CFD projects to be hoped to reduce that to sub 10 percent. And then by the time of the end of the decade, if we can get this continued support uh, to enable us to deploy more, reduce the technology risks, uh, help show to investors, you know, the credibility of what we're doing. We hope to be able to bring that, you know, maybe, hopefully, even within touching distance of where floating offshore wind hopes to be uh, in terms of its risk profile and what it can offer, um, you know, in terms of returns for, for debt project. Obviously, the key knock on of this, high cost of capital, high LCOE. And, and we've seen that, you know, if we look, the cost of capital that we've seen uh, for equity and debt and onshore wind and how drastically that's reduced from 2012 to today has had a big impact uh, on the cost that we see people bidding in uh, into future uh, CFD uh, round projects. Final thing to say uh, is two last things is if, if we are looking at the future and we're looking to set a target, 
what sort of target should that be? Uh, there's a recent blog post that I put out, uh, Marine Energy Wales kindly put out, which I, uh, I suppose, rather audaciously suggested maybe a gigawatt of, of tidal stream uh, by the by the end of the decade. I mean, having worked in this industry for long enough, I really should have learned uh, my lessons now uh, from all those coming before me in terms of you know <laughs> stating ambitious targets that can't be achieved. But in in another respect, if we look at it, the project pipeline is here. Um, we are getting technology that is ready to deploy at scale. And what we need now is you know, to drive this cost down and to drive the, the supply chain opportunities. We need that bigger target to help uh, larger industrials invest uh, in, in supply chain to help you know, them create the tooling and, and to move the costs down. Because it's not just innovation that's going to get us there. It's actually you know, kind of learning by doing and getting stuff out there. But the benefits if we do that is that we have a really clear and strong UK supply chain story. Um, the supply chain for the O2 is literally the length and breadth of the country. Uh, and you know, we have been looking specifically again at the Morelise project and looking at the amount of Welsh content that we can get there. We believe there's a strong supply chain in that area that we could work with, um, as is kind of across the rest of the UK. You know, this is just a snapshot of the supply chain we were able to use for the O2. Um, these aren't the only companies that can supply into the marine energy industry, but the point is you know, there, there was you know, several companies bidding in for this work in, at every stage of the game, all with several companies based in the UK. So this is a fantastic opportunity for the UK uh, to take this forward uh, and help us move forward on our cost reduction trajectory. Thank Great, you. thank you very much, Oliver and uh, some stimulating um, slides there and some great information that you've shared about the uh, the technology design so thank you very much indeed for that um on the panel and uh, i'd like to introduce uh, david langston he's program manager at wave energy scotland david would you like to introduce yourself and uh, wave energy scotland good morning thank you simon yes uh, i work for wave energy scotland and i'll give you a very quick brief overview uh, we're driving the search for innovative solutions to develop uh, cost competitive uh, wave energy. That's what we're here for. Um, these are pictures of some of our uh, recent projects. So, how do we achieve cost reduction? Well, uh, I guess the first two to look at are learning by research and learning by doing. Um, these two are, are fundamental parts of the learning rate. In the early stages, it's mostly um, innovation through R&D and, and later stages, it's uh, experience by actually doing things. Economies of scale, I'll talk about that a bit later on. Markets for wave energy, um, it's obvious that um, companies are looking for early markets that can support a uh, higher uh, cost of energy. Uh, but there's also, there needs to be markets in the future of uh, clear messages that there's going to be uh, supports and subsidies for uh, energy from from wave energy, uh, and without that, I mean, this is common signal, obviously, but without that, there's there's no uh, incentive for uh, people to invest in developing new technologies. So that's an essential part of it. Cost of capital adequately covered by Oliver a minute ago. So the the methodology will change depending on the, the stage of, of development. Um, from concept right through to commercialization. Um, these are the, the innovation uh, stages. Um, we strongly support stage gates between these various stages. And we'll just cover them very quickly. First of all, is concept creation, which is R&D. Uh, we're developing, a, working on a project called Seaweed, which is a concept creation uh, development tool. That'll be launched in the summer. Concept refinement to small scale um, prototype um, is really sort of equivalent to technology readiness levels uh, three to six. Um, that's R and D, and this is where our programs have focused to date. Uh, we've had five programs: power takeoff, wave energy converters, uh, control systems, materials, and quick connection systems. Um, and we've been using the pre-commercial procurement model. So we've been funding uh, a number of companies to enter at stage one. So for example, with Quick Connection Systems, seven companies stage, came in at stage one. 
for uh, materials, 10 for control systems. We have 13 companies in stage one, and it's a competition uh, to get into stage two. And that has really helped to um, focus people's minds. And then it's another competition to get into stage three and to actually deploy the devices. So that's that model is now being used in Europe Wave. This is a, a Horizon 2020 project, which we started on the 1st of January. This will run for five years. That's 22.5 million euros. So that's the, the long same principles as our original programs. And then the last three stages, obviously it's now getting into experience uh, and that's where most of the cost savings will come from, from actually deploying and learning. And also there's economies of scale. Now, um, Oliver was, was talking about expanding the size of turbines and that can certainly be done uh, in, in tidal. There is probably a limit in terms of the size of wave energy devices. And we actually had a, a piece of work we, we commissioned to look at this, this issue. And there's probably a limit of around about 10 megawatts. I mean, there will be some savings by, by increasing the sizes, but it will be limited. That report is available on our library if anyone's interested. Um, the more de devices that are deployed, obviously that's where uh, mass manufacturing will start to uh, bring down the, uh, the cost as well. And then there's um, deployment on large levels, so farm farms, and we're actively looking at uh, array projects uh, in, in Scotland at the moment. And then we're also working on various tools to help uh, monitor and measure um, factors as we're going through these various stages, and these will be coming out this year as well. And that is me. Thank you, Simon. Brilliant. Thank you very much, David. Uh, excellent presentation there. Obviously, a lot going on um, in Wave Energy Scotland and well done for securing the um, the Europe Wave um, project as well. We look forward to hearing about more, more about that. Um, great. So you've heard there from um, our panelists um, of huge range of expertise and knowledge, um, but a lot of similarities and a lot of similar sort of challenges. And the one I want to dig into now, because we've got we've got at least 30 minutes now for questions and answers. So that's brilliant. Um, I want to just talk about the supply chain. Um, obviously, they're um, critical to, um, uh, you know, achieving innovation. But are we doing the right things to engage with the supply chain? And maybe, Guy, I'll, I'll start off with you because you obviously went first. You haven't spoken for a little while. So, um, Maybe I'd invite you to um, just tell us a little bit about supply chain engagement from RWE's perspective. You know, how would you go about it? Are we doing the right things? And and then I'll come on to um, James to sort of follow up on that. Yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> breaking it down, we obviously have a big supply chain through our our existing supply chain in offshore fix. So, so that the usual suspects of of turbine suppliers, cable suppliers. Um, offshore insulation consenting, all of that, that the same supply chain will be used. The challenges we have are, of course, in the substructures, the new supply chains in, in moorings and, and the interfaces between uh, cables, moorings, and then, and then towing systems. Um, I think from a, <clears throat> from a supply chain perspective, there's going to be a lot of localization and and one of our biggest constraints is going to be you know geography if you look at the the locations a lot of a lot of the uh the 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 predicted demand for floating offshore it's it, apac has the the greatest um, kind of volumes but you know similar to to, to work i mean it's fair to, in my introduction i didn't point out the fact that i spent seven years in the tidal industry and you know a lot of the work with atlantis that i, that I focused on the final years was around industrialization around how can we manufacture um, how can we create a manufacturing strategy um, that uses a global supply chain that could be managed from one, you know, UK office, but deployed, whether that's in, in Japan, in Indonesia. Um, so that local content, that look, that modular design. And I think it's a, it's the same, it's the same challenges in floating for us at this stage. Um, so I think uh, early engagement beyond um, the existing supply chain is probably still quite immature, Simon. Um, and I think those substructure suppliers so you know you talk about cornwall in the southwest and and you think about some of the port space the heavy lift the manufacturing that, that could be available it will all be locally locally sourced and that's a, that's a kind of key strategic initiative for for rwe at this time okay that, that, that's brilliant 
and 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 james just picking up on on some of those points that um guy mentioned you know how, how do we ensure that um you know local supply chains do get a fair crack of the whip and and we don't sort of just stand on the beach watching everything happen from from overseas well yeah i thank you that that's that's called a, a leading question that simon so i, I was going to be that. james sorry <laughs> <laughs> I was going to start the other end about how to engage with the supply chain from 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 material base all the way through to to you know O and M as you call it MRO as uh, as uh, perhaps we call it maintenance repair operations. Um, it's always an engagement process and it, it starts early and it's interesting quite often when we look at uh, supply chain impact reports by catapult or different regions etc. We see these inspirational numbers appearing. Um, that would that, that automatically government should respond to and, and, and supply chain sh sh should re respond to. And before I get to your uh, sitting on the coast question, what I, what I want to say here is that when I tested recently the one on steel, and of course you may be aware this morning the news is breaking that Tata Steel is not in Holland is not being sold and Tata Steel in, in Europe is back up in the air again as to what they're going to do. But I tested it with the supply chain of Tata Sales as liberty to the conversion of these steel industries going down to the small companies. They're, they're watching it. They're not engaged in it. Um, yeah. they, they see big volume, but it's not directing any of their strategies right now as at what steel they're going to produce, how they're going to produce it, how they're going to convert it in it. And although we, you've asked the question about the small side, uh, you know, that, that's of concern for me, that we're not inspiring the right stakeholders as to ensure that we anchor uh, at material base as well as technology based significant, significant proportions of the supply chain itself. And therefore, we're always at risk for cost and we certainly won't learn the lessons. When we talk about the existing supply chain, you know, it, it is it is a process of engagement. It is an ongoing process of, of engagement. It's not a sales pitch. It, it starts in the design office. The design office is your biggest risk on cost. Always has been, always will be. And I say that as a designer, so don't get me wrong. Okay, if they don't know what the existing supply chain has as capable and capacity, they will take it in a different direction. So the engagement of, of supply chain on, on small, medium-sized companies, uh, whether it's in it's in uh, installation or connection or or, or or servicing, it's imperative that you know what the capability of the existing supply chain is. Also important to know what supply chain could transfer into a transition into that area if and when the volume starts coming. You're still to start engaging with them because you're going to need them a little, but they, and, they, and you have to know that in your design office. The biggest fear I have quite often is that people are designing in an office and not designing in the supply chain. Um, so it doesn't matter whether you teach them design for manufacturing, design for assembly, design for service, they have to know the supply chain capability and capacity. Work with that and when physics doesn't allow you to do that, then you need to step up that into looking at, at how do I bring that technology or that material base into it. So that's the yeah. caution and it's not a one-off engagement. Don't finish your project TRL 7, 8, and then come to the supply chain for optimization. Make sure it's there in the beginning. Great, thanks very much. Would, would any of the other panelists like to um, jump in at this point and um, provide their views on this? Yep, Oli. Yeah, I, I can just kind of uh, come in and, um, and just, I suppose, really back up what, what James was saying in that respect. I mean, when the, we went through the um, tender process for the O2, uh, which is obviously before my time at Orbital, um, but talking to the guys and looking at how we're going to tend their future machines and, and how we'll do this, you know, <clears throat> it wasn't a case of, right, we just put tender documentation specifications, like, right, out it goes and just fingers crossed something comes back. Um, the the way that this was actually built up and tendered was, you know, actually by going out to the supply chain, understanding what people's capabilities were, understanding what physically could be done in some of these locations so that, we're actually considering that and factoring that uh, in into the specification, and it's something that we're doing at the moment. Um, you know, looking at, at how we're building the next O2, uh, which hopefully will will be on the way to soon, uh, picking up at in uh, up, up at EMEC. But then also looking at some of those future projects. Um, you know, looking at more lines, uh, for example, where hopefully we'll be putting machines in the water there. Um, the balance that, that I always find though is, is something between you know. Uh, at what point something becomes real and really tangible 
uh, and not wanting to waste people's time, you know, in the supply chain. You know, they're, they're busy. Um, and, it, you know, we don't want to be wasting people's time on, you know, jam tomorrow. Uh, but at the same time, it's important for people to try and understand uh, what we can do, there, which I think you know, is, is sometimes you know, the, the benefit of events like this and being able to engage through some of the regional economic development agencies to be able to help put you in touch with some of those organisations at the right time. Yeah. I mean, Oli, in your presentation, you talked about um, moving towards volume manufacture and looking at that. But for the supply chain, looking at the potential numbers from Tidal, is, is that not going to be a bit challenging? Uh, yeah. <laughs> in a, in a uh, nutshell. maybe Tim wants to come in, you know, in terms of what what he's looking at in in, in sort of supply chain needs as well. How, how do you how do you sort of start to convince him that um, you know there will be serious numbers at the end of the day? Do, do you have to look across different sectors to look at for for um, you know similar sort of products and things? I, I think that's one angle. I think I think if we're honest, we've also seen um, the the supply chains probably become a bit fatigued in that. Um, you know, with with Tidal as, as the example, over many years we've been talking about the, the jam tomorrow and, uh, of, uh, and where the potential can get to. And, and a lot of them not technology related, a lot of them in terms of uh, revenue support and other other barriers. It, it hasn't materialised as, as fast as we would have. So th that gives you chicken and egg situation to break. Um, I think from my presentation you you'll remember that there was about 50 percent of the of the sort of potential lcoe reductions come from volume manufacture so i think um there are a lot of r d projects out there that are very much focused on the technology side of it and in and in terms of quantifying that side um and there's probably less focus on on us as a sector um really being able to get the right evidence behind the, the the cost reductions you'd expect from scale um so i mean some of the projects we've been involved in um have been um you know rather than going to suppliers and asking for quotes have actually been going to suppliers um approaching them to do a paid study on on our behalf and i think that's you know an angle we might need to be in at the moment because if, if you can if you can't convince that uh, you know a, a patient tomorrow for them to really put the effort in and really genuinely think about um how would you do this at 200 megawatt scale um because because we don't we don't just want a quick quote or or, or a guess we want significant effort so we, we have had yeah. a route of on a commercial basis um and and certainly the advantage of that is that you you can end up with with genuine ev evidence about what will be possible which is it really really important when you come to try and get to investment financial close of a project rather than um having based it off a generic learning rate of, of theoretically if we go to 50 megawatts you would expect these economies of scale th that doesn't hold water when you actually get to that financial decision yeah and, and i think you know to harken back to james's point and it's, it's all about relationships isn't it and establishing the, establishing those relationships and getting a feel for you know the the, the capabilities of, of supply chain and um, david in, you know in the in the world of wave um you know you, you deal with technology developers but obviously you you dip into the supply chain as well are there, are there some unique problems there in terms of convincing the supply chain about the merits of, of wave energy or, or is it just a you know it's another technology that developed? um well the the um supply chain companies that have been involved with the program um, have performed very well and been very happy with with, uh, with the process. Um, I mean, we have had, for example, companies like uh, Umbra, uh, who are a um, big supplier to the aerospace industry, um, supply power takeoff, uh, ball screw technologies, a very mature technology, but applying that to the wave energy industry. But yeah, they, there is always a question. I mean, if there's no immediate market, um, and if a company's got um, is making money and wants to you know, concentrate on making money, that's what they're there for. Um, without those, uh, without the belief that there's going to be uh, in the short term uh, the possibility of massive sales, it is, it is it's sometimes a difficult ask. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks, David. Okay. Let's, let's turn our attention to um, cost of capital and um, um, capital expenditure. Um, and then we'll pick up some of the questions that are, that are 
bubbling up from um, the delegates in the chat. But Guy, I mean, in terms of looking at, you know, where's the low hanging fruit then for um, reducing capex uh, in your world? Yeah, so that's a complex question. Um, I think when you get to the CFD, CFD scale projects, Simon, um, it's not there's there's not necessarily any 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 key driver. You know, we've got challenges around the interfaces of moorings, connections, and cables. Like I said, um, we've got challenges around O and M and the the ongoing debates of whether it's tow to port or whether it's it's um, it, it's repair at sea. Um, but I think when you're in an auction where you can lose by by a pound or by a euro, you know, for us it's about LCOE across the full board. You know, it's 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 the corporate expertise as well as all the the technical level of a uh, of LCOE, and and it's kind of central to to RWE. There's a within the merger between Energy and, and Eon that we've now find ourselves in as RWE Renewables. There's now a dedicated LCOE team of of twelve uh, commercial and technical engineers that are that are working on LC opportunities across the full project lifecycle. Um, I think that the, the main challenge for us is going to be is scaling up and of the manufacturing very similar to tidal very similar to wave it's the unit production you know it's how can we reduce that complex engineering to be able to manufacture quickly yeah yeah and, and uh, do any of the other panelists want to come in on any of those points that guys um mentioned there i mean guys, are you still are you still thinking about um you know large-scale repairs offshore for um, floating wind I think it's now pollution. coming into. <clears throat> yeah, I think offshore heavy heavy lift is is now coming into offshore fixed, and I think it will happen in 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 offshore floating. I think for the time being, early project base cases will be tow to port, um, and that's a key that's a key area for for innovation. You know, t already talking about offshore cranes that 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 climb towers, um, but at the moment we it's it's technologically driven. We don't have the we don't have the, the technology in the vessels to be able to do um, floating to floating. And, you know, at the same time onshore, you know, that everybody thinks let's go, let's go bigger turbines, big, you know, floating is further offshore, big, bigger road diameters. Well, onshore, if your base case is tow to port, at which point does your port run out of infrastructure to be able to handle that, you know, that, that, that technology and those components. So again yeah. going back to the that i mentioned the the industry industry groups and go back to supply chain and, and industry build out and the early engagement there these are all industry issues that we're that we're currently tackling okay and i think we've got a we've got a question actually around around port infrastructure so that's that's nicely timed um i'm going to move on to the delegate yeah. questions now um we've got we've still got 15 minutes remaining we've got quite a few questions coming through now um i think the first one was from joe joe thanks for posing that question it was a question for tim around the financials applied to the full model system and does that provide the financials to build the system and reach commercialization uh does it take into account through life support o m costs for sort of 25 years expected life of the platform so, it, so, so certainly yes it does um the, the models absolutely cover the full life cycle costs so yes there's the the initial capex but then there's absolutely the ongoing O&M is is considered all the way through to decommissioning um to, to give you a sort of an idea of sort of the complexity um we're obviously looking at um there's a number of factors so so we, we look at different types of, of things that could go wrong and we, we categorize those and it could be from small things like uh, an oil change to that the, the require um more significant intervention or a gearbox failure or something um, and, and the model looks at um, how long it takes uh, in, in what weather conditions you can access a, a device whether it's a, a floating wind platform um, and so there's, there's obviously technology enable you to access a device in in a wider range of weather conditions which which help um, and, and so there's obviously two two downsides to what's happening with with this maintenance there's if you've got a fault and you're then not able to operate then there's a reduction in revenue which is accounted and then there's also a cost in terms of 
going and making that repair in terms of the components and in terms of the uh, the, the, the people time and the vessel time, etc. Um, so, so maybe just to put it in the context of, of, of sort of your sector with, um, with 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 electrical equipment. I mean, we would, for example, more some uh, redundant quality. Um, so there'd be a, a higher capex and and then you know lower failures or, or and, and then therefore be a higher yield and we would be going through hundreds if not thousands of combinations of different designs w w through through a model like that in order to optimize it okay thanks very much tim and thanks joe for that question um james davis james you're recommending don't use a ferrari engine choose a daimler are you a daimler driver then are you no, I'm not a German right, David Daimler driver, but there's a lot more behind that. But the automotive people in the room will understand it. And uh, and uh, I, I have a V10. It's not a Ferrari V10. I'll assure you that I wouldn't I wouldn't bother to waste the money on that bit there. But uh, it, it, it indicates the skill of the design of it. So it was a quick please don't take too long on that one. I think that's a that's a fair enough quip, James. Um, I mean, the, the, clearly, obviously, the point that I'm trying to get across here is that the design we've actually put under the bonnet here um and the majority of the of the turbine and the o2 is ready now for kind of commercial projects effectively there's some small bits of tinkering we can do around the edge of it you know to improve this further uh but the blocks are actually there and importantly once it's in the water there's things that we can do that will help uh, improve lcoe uh, over time and over operation okay good thanks for that um, Joe again has put an interesting link into the chat, so have a look at that um, around um, cost reduction for cable connector failures. Um, and I think it was Pierre, yeah, who, who coming back to your point, Guy, about um, layup space and things like that. His question was around large scale floating offshore wind projects. What kind of construction schedule are you looking at? And um, looking at the float of footprint, is that expected to increase to a point where you actually, you know, you run out of room to store stuff and that then dictates your sort of um your schedule and your installation schedule yeah i think purely from a construction perspective then the <clears throat> the the schedule will be the same as 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 fixed there's no reason why it should be any longer um coming back to the 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 element of industrialization you know lead times in the procurement phase post fid so the overall the overall difference is, I guess, that we will have a different contracting structure and strategy for, for floating. Uh, depending on where you're deploying and what substructure you're, you're using, you know, it could have a, a big impact on your lead times and, and your procurement and manufacturing phases. But I think, yeah, Pierre's got a, he's got a valid point around the, the actual footprint of, of those. And you look at the size of some substructures, some substructures such as principal power, it's a huge, huge piece of engineering, but at the same time it's built to float. So there is an element of, of storage, but you know, the cable storage has been a huge issue in the, in the floating as in the offshore wind industry for years. And, you know, there's been some quite innovative solutions and, and, and places where that's stored. So from a storage perspective, okay. Yeah. The, there's challenges from a weather window and installation, um, perspective that can all be managed you know that's very well understood uh, i think it comes back to my point around you know evolution not revolution yep brilliant thanks guy um i'm going to jump over your other comments um james um but good to see you sort of uh, stoking the fires of conversation there um question from uh, ian hi ian um panel if you could standardize one thing that would make a big cost difference what would that be so maybe David, um, any thoughts on that? What would be the one thing that you would standardise? Probably well, standard weight. Uh, well, exactly. I'll probably uh, flick the uh, the question around slightly. Um, it's a, re a recurring theme for, for Wave is the fact that there are so many different types of, of devices as opposed to a, you know, every wind turbine is the same three three bladed horizontal axis. With uh, with Wave has not got to that stage. Um, I'm not convinced it's going to end up with just a single design. Um, yeah. how, however, for, for people to invest in the technology, um, they want to make, make sure they are backing the right horse. And while there's so many horses in the race, it is quite difficult to uh, mm. to get that. And that's part of the reason why we're developing this uh, seaweed tool to to act as a, a way of filtering out some of them, so we can concentrate more on the ones that are likely to mm. 
to be to be winners. So I think that's yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so a stand, not necessarily a standard, but a smaller number of device types would be a definite advantage. Yeah. Do you, do you see it as a, a role of of Wave Energy Scotland to to forcibly drive um, uh, consolidation in design, or, or, or do you prefer well, to step back and let it happen naturally? Uh, well, we prefer to step back and um, let it happen naturally, but. Um, part of the reason for having this tool is so that we can um, inform decisions and um, identify where it's not worth making investments. Because while we're, we're funding you know, subsystems, there's a subsystem for a, a device type that doesn't have a future um, is not worth it. So we'd rather put the money into something else. So, but being able to inform that decision on what type of device types um, deserve to be funded um i think that is partly our, our role as well yeah yeah uh last chance anyone else want to jump in on that question around standardization uh yeah just yeah. Uh, a bit of cheekily here simon i i'd standardize uh you know uh, government impetus and support for the wave and tidal energy industry for the for the next 10 years so that it was consistent <laughs> i'll lend you my magic wand <laughs> thanks <laughs> Good ask, a good ask. Okay, we've got a question from um, uh, Manuel. Um, I think he and I had a bit of a conversation yesterday, actually. Uh, and, and he's suggesting that export is not a key issue, but it's more about doing your homework, I think, before you, you go um, overseas for deployments. And and maybe suggesting that outside of Europe, um, there isn't necessarily the, the, maybe the right skill levels and things like that. Um, I don't know if any of the panelists want to sort of comment on having looked at export opportunities and how you conduct your your initial sort of um you know site sniffing sort of thing and, and research into into moving overseas maybe guy do you want to pick up first yeah but you know lots of that would kind of come from my uh, from my background in the tidal space um which has laid you know a great foundation for many of my kind of yeah much of my career but i mean Manuel is talking about not being an issue, but I think it's an opportunity. Um, <clears throat> I think we, we, there's an opportunity in, in all sectors that we're talking about today. And if you look at the um, the growth and, and leadership of offshore fixed in the UK, you know, there's an opportunity for us to quickly capitalize that uh, globally in the floating space. But with those rapidly developing markets that I pointed out in, in the presentation, there's many other com countries that are, that are that are close behind us. So unless we do soon, you know, we will we will lose that that opportunity. I mean, um, again, having worked for Atlantis and yet, yeah, you know, I'm, I don't work for many more, but they are currently and, you know, this month they have they have taken a, a turbine that has been largely manufactured in Scotland and taken it to Japan. And it's been it's been deployed with Nagasaki. And I think that's a fantastic achievement. Um, you know, I worked in Japan with on on that project, and, and it's an absolutely great, you know, result of Scottish engineering um, that is now operating subsea in in Nagasaki, and the Japanese continue to be very int interested in in the tidal space. Yeah, no, that that, that is a good story. Um, David, did you want to pick up on that? No, just having worked a long time in uh, for, for wave energy companies and and tidal companies, wave gen and uh, marine current turbines. I mean. Once the lockdown stops and we're able to go and travel, I don't think you can substitute actually going and visiting the people and meeting the people in the various locations. So for international sales, that's going to be a key part of it, getting those relationships in place. Yeah, no, absolutely. Okay, thanks. Um, Maria, thank you very much for your question. Important question on minimising environmental impact of devices. <coughs> um, maybe Oliver, would you like to sort of quickly touch on that? Yeah, you know, I can I can pick up from that from the beginning. So I mean, kind of the uh, environmental impact is kind of it's baked into the design from from the offset. You know, look, looking at that, looking from the the coatings that we're using, uh, but also then looking at the instrumentation uh, that we put across the turbine. I mean, again, um, I suppose one of the we, we think one of the advantages that we've got you know, in terms of where we sit within the water column because it's higher up, you get greater visualization cameras we, we hope will be a bit better um for environmental monitoring um you obviously there was a, a detailed campaign that was completed with the deployment of the sr2000 uh, and there'll be a follow-up uh campaign 
uh, for the deployment of the O2. Uh, there will, you know, so that report uh, and information will be produced by EMEC, uh, Fed Food to Marine Scotland. But we also hope that that information will be able to share with, with other regulators. Oh, we'll do it there. Okay. Okay, thanks very much, Oliver. You're, we're, we're losing the audio a little bit there. Um, Guy, just very quickly, anything you'd like to say from RWE perspective on looking at environmental impact? Obviously, you, you've gone through your, your um, site impact assessments and things like that, but does that sort of analysis carry on thereafter? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't speak so much about uh, in the design phase and the engineering, uh, but certainly in, it, carbon footprint is becoming a very big kind of driver of, of, our, of our decisions made by the board. And we're under more and more pressure that corporates, you know. Um, so interesting listening to James and about how we work the supply chains and, you know, how that would work in the Celtic Sea would be very important to RWE. Um, but yeah, the incorporation of environmental impact into the design is i'm afraid i'm, I'm not at this stage um <laughs> qualified enough to to mention james is okay I, you know there we go james is going to uh, jump in there well i, I don't think i'm qualified uh, certainly not anymore on that but i do just want to make it a little point of this one you know environmental analysis in the design office now is fundamental of course we know that but you have to start looking at predictive environmental analysis because the changes in this area we're going to see by public vote and legislation and policy will be very very significant um and i uh, I, I in the in the in the chat i use the illustration of scrap in space uh, and, and this will become very quickly emotive within the public um uh, on it so so both the carbon levy of this issue will but as we already see in the EU changing on carbon levy across borders, etc., not is not only will it become a cost driver, but it will become a an emotion issue that the public will start working on. So the choices we make now are, are very significant to, to consider end of life and carbon levy and other things that I that perhaps there are more experts in it. Please don't assume the current environmental risk assessment will be anywhere near what you're facing in ten years' time. This is a huge yeah, I, th I think you're absolutely right james i think the, you know, the importance of carbon footprint and keeping that minimized will will sort of ripple across you know procurement activities um you know general designs you know the, the lot so so really important we've got oh, barely time for one more question but uh theo van der Kamen has asked a question about supply chain confidence and really oliver what does that pipeline look like to achieve um some of those um numbers you were talked about, particularly that sort of magic 200 megawatts installed capacity very quickly. Oliver? Can you hear me? He's on mute, Oliver. He is, but he's not saying anything. So. <laughs> I think I mean Oliver did show up. Did sort of suggest um, had a slide there with some of the uh, the activities and pipeline in the UK. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll pick that up separately with him. Yeah, James, did you want to come in for a final word? Yeah, one of the big things on I find is that there's always a cliff or a very long slope, and and yet most of the time the supply chain you need is already working in this area. So you're transitioning capacity not not looking for new cap install capacity in installing capacity is horrendously expensive and very difficult okay and fraught with risk transitioning capacity is significant so when we write that we need we need this tonnage of steel we need this this number of of turbines and this number of rotors you've got to work on the import capacity transition yeah. otherwise otherwise it's jammed tomorrow perception all the time yeah. and they Absolutely. can see how we transfer uh, you know, a million tons over the next 10 years, they're, they're excited by it. If they think it's new, eh, it's risk, huge risk, yeah. because every technology is seven years later. Okay, great. Thanks very much, James. We're going to have to close down there. Um, it's been an excellent panel session. Um, I've really enjoyed that conversation. Some excellent presentations, um, some really good numbers in there as well, and some exciting takeaway stuff um, for, the, uh, for, for the Friday. Um, thank you to delegates who posed the questions. And thank you from Marine Energy Wells for enabling us to uh, to get together and have this chat. So uh, I'll now pass back to uh, Jay.